going to spend some time now building uh, and using an algebraic model, very simple algebra, uh, of Keynesian economics, a way to portray the operation of the economy, particularly from the Keynesian perspective. We've done that before with graphs. We'll use the graphs in this model. But we're going to put numbers to the concepts and use the numbers to show how mathematically uh, the model is trying to explain to us what's going on in the economy compared to what should be going on in the economy. So this is the introductory, introductory phase of the Keynesian algebraic model. Fairly simple one, okay? Remember that with Keynes, uh, a couple of terms we use for Keynesian economics. Sometimes we talk about demand management economics. In the Keynesian view, the strength or weakness in the economy is found in the level of spending that occurs. That in the Great Depression, for example, the problem was a lack of spending, both by businesses and consumers, and to some degree by government back then, although government played a much smaller role than it does today in the United States economy. But Keynesian economics targets spending as the the driving force of the economy, and then categorizes spending into four categories. Uh, let's go ahead and list them very quickly. Category one, the big one, consumption spending by households. In the United States economy, somewhere close to 70% of our economy in healthy times comes from the spending by households, by consumers by endurable goods, non-durable goods, automobiles, beer, pizza, whatever, okay? Consumption is essential. Now, what do we know about consumption? Very quickly, we know that the driving force behind how much money you or I spend is our income. So we say consumption is a function of our income level, and we abbreviate income with the letter Y. Now, when we translate this consumption behavior into numbers, we have what we call the consumption function, and it's usually going to be stated, at least in our model, something like this. Consumption is some arbitrary number, uh, 410, plus some percentage, let's say 90%, of income. What this is telling us is if income were zero, we'd still be spending money, at least for a short time. We may borrow it, we may take it out of savings, but this is the, the element of the model that says, you'll spend this much even if your income temporarily drops to zero. Of course, if it permanently drops to zero, you won't be spending money, nobody will loan you money, you'll use up all your savings. But in the sense of an algebraic equation, this is the intercept, and then the most important, and in fact the keystone of the whole model, element of the model here is this point 90, all right? The coefficient in front of y. This is the marginal propensity to consume. Now your textbook will have a lot about that. Read it carefully. The marginal propensity to consume asks how much out of every extra dollar that you receive in income do you spend rather than save? In this model it would appear that on average people spend 90% of any additional income they earned. So the marginal propensity to consume is the change in consumption when you have a change in income. If you got an extra $100, you would spend $90 of it, so your MPC is .90. That's one of the things you want to look at very quickly when you see these models. What is the coefficient in front of Y? Later, soon, we'll call that YD, but we'll clarify that down the road. The coefficient in front of y. It'll be a positive number. It will be a number less than 1 because you can't spend more than 100% of the money you got. Okay? Well, you shouldn't anyway. Okay? Bear with me. So consumption is the first element of spending in these four categories of spending we're going to play with in this model. The second category, put it here, is investment spending. This is the spending by businesses. Businesses buying capital goods, buying new equipment, buying uh, producing more inventories, building new construction. 
So we're going to abbreviate that with I. Investment spending. Now, now in finance and elsewhere, when you hear investment, you think stocks and bonds. Remember, this is macroeconomics. And the term investment, we take this from, from Keynes, is referring to the spending by businesses in the purchase of raw materials and the payment of their workers, etc. Investment spending, when we set up our models for right now, I'll just plug in an arbitrary number and say, here it is, $31. Okay? Note that with both of these spending uh, streams, what's going on? Every time that dollar is spent, it is buying something. It is creating or showing a demand for something. And if, as money gets spent, sellers produce to meet that demand, and in the process, they're creating jobs. And then they're paying their workers who, in turn, spend money. So this is all part of the circular flow. Let's add the other two elements to the model. Make a little room here. Uh, the third element of spending, government spending. And when we talk about government spending in our United States economy, we're talking about state, local, and federal. And we know that's a pretty good chunk of change, okay? That's a, that's a pretty large element of spending. What all does it buy? Well, it buys military, defense. It buys perhaps roads and construction, perhaps some degree of health care, okay? Remember, though, there is a distinction as we go down the road. When government spends money in order to acquire a service or a, a product, a road or the, or the work of one of its employees, that's government spending. But when government puts money in someone's hands, let's say Social Security, or Medicare, or some form of welfare, or unemployment compensation. Those are not government spending flows. We have a different name for those. Those are called transfers. That is a transfer of money from the general taxes collected into the hands of people who, by whatever definition, are entitled to those monies. Maybe they're disabled, maybe they've been unemployed, maybe they are elderly, etc. So government spending is not the same thing, is not the same thing as transfers. Transfers are things like Social Security. Just kind of stick that in your mind, unemployment. We'll come back to that as we go along. And then the last, this is the third, the last element of our model, the last element of spending, is spending by the foreign sector, by our trading partners around the world. When they're buying our products, but also, by the way, remember, we're buying theirs. And so we call it net exports, which is how much did you buy from them, how much did you import, and how much did you export, and what was the difference. And so net exports, in the United States particularly, is a negative number because we're buying more from them than we're selling them. Our net exports going out is a negative number. So this would be X sub n, net exports in our model. And again, with government, we'll just plug in an arbitrary number just to make the model easy. Net exports may be a negative number, negative 6. And once we've plugged these numbers in, we'll go through building, solving, and analyzing this algebraic representation of what's going on in the economy. And that's what we're doing here, okay? All right. Let's get this out of the way. And let's talk about the way a typical model is going to look. I've got one written down here so I don't screw it up too bad, all right? Here's the way you'll typically see it. You'll see all these numbers. Consumption is 126 plus 0.95. Now watch the, watch the difference here. Y-D. I told you we were going to get to that. Y is income, gross income. How much money did you earn? YD is how much did you get? It's called your disposable income. It is your income after they take out your taxes, but after you also include any entitlements you may be receiving. If you're eligible for Social Security but you're still working, you may be getting both regular earned income and your Social Security payment, and then you've got to subtract out your taxes. So here's what we do. We say that your disposable income, YD, is your gross income minus any taxes that are taken out of your pay plus any transfers that you receive. 
Let me, let me put a little red star next to that because that's going to be important when we set this model up. Okay, bear with me. Okay. Um, next element, I, investment spending, second category. An arbitrary number. We picked 32. How much is this? This is 126 million or billion or trillion or gazillion dollars, depending on the size of the economy you may be describing. So we're not worried about how many zeros are up there, and we're darn sure not going to write them all out. But imagine this stood for $126 billion or a million dollars, depending on the economy. Bear with me here. Third element of spending, government spending. Oh, we plug that in at 21. And our net exports in this economy, this hypothetical economy, negative four. So there's your four spending flows. Okay? Now a couple of things to add to that. Transfer payments. How much does the government transfer over in entitlements to people? Made up a number here. Uh, transfers are 11. And how much taxes does the government pull out of the economy from businesses, from households? Plugged in a number here. Taxes are 30. So there's your entire model the way it's going to be given to you. You won't be told that. It will be assumed that if you see YD, you know that disposable income is gross income minus taxes plus transfers. Plus transfers. Okay. Now your task then is to set this model up according to this. The total income in the economy is made up of all the spending that takes place. Because when I spend money in your business, it's spending to me, but it's income to you. So whether you say total spending or total income, you're saying the same thing. So here's how we do it. We say total income equals total spending. C plus I plus G plus XM. And hopefully for the rest of your life, if you ever see that equation again, you'll go, oh, my God, that was a macro with Strickland. Yeah, I know. Roll your eyes, okay? But this is where we're starting once we've been given this data. We're going to plug these numbers in over here and do the calculation. And here's how we do it. I'm hoping you took notes on this, okay? I hope you wrote them down. I'm going to set them up, and we'll see what we've got. All right. When I set it up, I'm going to have income equals, state the big equation, C plus I plus G plus net exports. And plugging in my numbers, and I wrote them down too, so I'm not going to lose them. I'm going to say that income equals C, which is 126 plus 0.95 YD. Now look what we're going to do here. YD is actually income minus taxes, taxes were 30, plus transfers, 11. And so that is YD from the equation earlier. Okay? You've got to make that substitution when you set this thing up. And then the rest is just plug in the other three numbers. The value for I was, we'll add to this, plus 32. Uh, G, government spending, was 21. And plus net exports, but that was a negative, so it's a negative 4. So here's our whole equation. Look at all of that. Okay? Now what you've got here, remember this is Y. You have one equation with one unknown variable, Y. And so you have to... Pull all of this together and calculate the value of y. And the y that we're looking for, we're going to call our equilibrium income or equilibrium spending. That's what we're after initially. So let's do it kind of quick here, right? I'm going to ignore this for a second and just add all these numbers up. I've got 126 plus 32, 158, 178, 179 minus 4. I've got 175 plus this term here, plus 0.95 times y minus 30 plus 11. Well, 0.95 times y. And then if I net these two against each other, I have a negative 30 plus 11. It gives me a negative 19. Negative 19 times a 0.95 is, in fact, let's see if I can find it here. 
Uh, I didn't do the math out. Okay, whatever it is. Um, minus 0.95 times 19. What I do know, because I did calculate that here, is when I, when I take this minus the other figure there, this comes up to 156.95. How about that? Plus 0.95 y. Okay, so far? Y equals all of this. I've just consolidated all this stuff together. What have I got to do now? I've got to solve for y. So I can subtract 0.95y from each side. I get 0.05y equals 156. Divide both sides by 0.05, and I get my equilibrium, and I hope I'm not going off the board here. My equilibrium, my y star, turns out to be 3139. 3139. I tend to double underscore it saying, see, I'm through with that calculation. This is the process of going through the model. This is the first step. Find the numbers, plug the numbers in correctly, do the calculation, not real advanced math by any stretch, and solve for equilibrium y star. And you, you'll have several examples of that as we go along. You can create your own. Just go back in and change the numbers. Practice with a friend or three. Make up your numbers, spread out, do them separately, compare your answers. You get, get used to the process. Once you've done this five or six times, it's pretty automatic. I'm not really interested in teaching any kind of math course. I want you to get to the correct answer, but much more importantly, I want you to be able to tell me, what does this mean? And that's our next step.